then uh, came here and joined us uh, in honor of the astrophysics exhibition here at, uh, at CFA. Uh, she's been involved in X-ray astronomy uh, missions really ever since. Uh, she uh, had a role with the uh, Einstein Observatory doing uh, uh, data validation and, uh, and verification. Uh, and then uh, led that uh, similar effort for the ROSAT Science uh, Data Center that was uh, here at SAO. Um, <clears throat> then she joined the uh, Chandra X-ray Center a couple of years before uh, launch and uh, served as the assistant director for the Chandra X-ray Center for 12 years. And then in 2014 was uh, selected as the uh, as a director, which she continues to serve as uh, now. Um, her research, I'm sure we'll hear some of uh, that in uh, what she's about to tell us about, uh, concentrates on multi-wavelength studies of um, active galaxies and, and quasars um, powered by mass, uh, supermassive black holes. And uh, her, her accomplishments are, are, uh, are plenty. Uh, I will just summarize a couple. She's been recognized through appointments uh, as a fellow to the uh, Royal Astronomical Society, uh, fellow to the Cambridge Philosophical um, <coughs> Society. Uh, and as of last year, as an honorary uh, fellow of uh, Jesus College of, at Cambridge. Um, as I think probably many of you know, uh, we're celebrating the 20 years uh, of, uh, since the launch of Chandra um, this year. And uh, we've had uh, <clears throat> a lot of different uh, activities and uh, sessions at professional meetings and such, as well as uh, colloquia series on uh, some of the scientific results. And it's quite fitting to have uh, Belinda give one of those uh, here. Um, so she will tell us about uh, many of the uh, great things that Chandra has done in the past uh, 20 years and, that and, and what we can look forward to uh, in the future as long as uh, her telephone doesn't go off with a TOO while we're talking. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll give you Belinda. <laughs> So my telephone's on mute, so if anyone has a TOO, sorry, you'll have to wait for an hour. <laughs> Are we keeping all the lights on? Thanks. <laughs> That's better. It looks, looks even prettier now. Not that I'm biased at all. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here to give you a taste, and it will only be a taste, of Chandra's X-ray revolution. Uh, over the last 20 years that we are planning to continue for many more. Um, this is a newly minted image of the satellite that was generated or put together to celebrate the 20 years. I'm absolutely sure that she doesn't look like this up in orbit having been there for 20 years. But this is what she looked like when she went. So, uh, This is the obligatory launch video. Um, Chandra was launched on the 23rd of July, early in the morning, from Cape Canaveral on the shuttle Columbia. Columbia was the only one that had a large enough um, payload bay to carry Chandra, which is the biggest satellite that was ever uh, taken up by the shuttle. It's uh, 10,000 pounds and 50, 45 feet long, which is two feet longer than Hubble, as it turns out. So up goes Chandra. I, I was actually there. Uh, with my kids, and it was really an amazing experience. Probably some of you have been to a launch. Um, this is the only one I've been to, and it really was incredible. The, it was as light as day for tens of seconds, and the whole ground beneath your feet shakes. And it really gave me an appreciation for how much power it takes to get to escape from the Earth's gravitational field, and also a sort of an amazement that humankind can do this, can actually escape and get up there and, and look out from a different viewing point. Um, this launch had a number of problems right from the beginning. Within eight seconds, there was a fuel leak detected. And uh, not many seconds after that, two of the DCUs on two of the engines failed over to their B side. And apparently, the crew were already looking to see if they would be able to land somewhere. It would have been very dangerous. That, but the B side held, uh, and the, the, you know, the shuttle kept going. So they did manage to get into orbit. They ended up a few miles low. Uh, because of that problem. Um, the next slide actually is showing how uh, Chandra was released. Um, a f only a few hours after they got up there, it had a lot of fuel on board, so the first thing they did was get rid of it in case anything would happen and it would blow them all up. So here is the shuttle backing away from Chandra once it's been released from the payload bay. This uh, was taken by the mission specialist, Katie Coleman, 
for the mission specialist for Chandra, uh, looking out of the window. It becomes a little shaky, as you can see in a minute, because she's presumably floating there and, and uh, with a handheld camera. But it gives us a nice view of Chandra if we keep watching for a minute until it before it goes <coughs> behind the um, earth, so into the shadow, not to be seen by human eyes again. Uh, I should note also that this shuttle was a record, uh, had another record that, that it set, which was it was the first to be commanded by a female commander, Eileen Collins. And we've been in touch with our astronauts, we think of them as ours at some level, um, over the 20 years. And in fact, Katie was at an event at the Operations Control Center in, in July when we celebrated both the, the opening of the new OCC and uh, 20 years since launch. Uh, and she was again with us at, in D.C. when we celebrated in August. So and Eileen Collins and she, and we think Steve Hawley, are going to be joining us for our meeting at the end of the year. So because the satellite or the shuttle was a few miles low, all the engineers back in Cambridge here at the Operations Control Center had to redetermine the firings for Chandra to get in its final orbit. But of course, they're professionals. They do this all the time. They were able to do it. But basically, they were starting from a different point and wanted to get to the same end point. So over the next two weeks, the, um, in, the engines of Chandra itself were fired at the perigee several times, at the apogee several times to get it into its final orbit, which is instead of the one and a half hour orbit of the shuttle is almost three days, 63 and a half hours. It's actually a very stable period to the orbit. It goes about a third of the way to the moon, 140,000 kilometers um, at this, at, at the apogee, and it goes into the radiation belts for about between 16 and 18 hours during the orbit. So we can observe for all but those 16 and 18 hours when we need to turn off the detectors and protect from them from the radiation. So the orbit actually has changed somewhat over the years. It becomes less elliptical and more elliptical, and it's actually tilted up almost to 90 degrees at one point and back again. But through all that, the um, period has been very stable. So what this means is that we can observe for about 70% of the time on the sky, and we do that routinely. So what was the big breakthrough that Chandra gave us? Well, there are actually a number um, of breakthroughs that Chandra represents in terms of X-ray astronomy, but I think the single most important is the spatial resolution, which is sub-arc second for the first time, about a factor of 10, better than the previous best satellite, which was ROSAT. Um, which was about a, uh, 10 years before, I guess, um, less than that. And so it now matched ground-based telescopes for the first time, and we could get to see real pictures for people who started in ground-based uh, astronomy. It certainly felt that way to me. This is a picture of the Orion Nebula, as taken by ROSAT. So I'm sure most of you know the Orion Nebula. It's a star-forming region. Uh, young stars are very bright X-ray sources. They're pretty dynamic places as matter falls in and gets blown out and magnetic fields get involved, etc. So they're bright X-ray sources. There were 250 sources found in this field. And you can see that in the middle here, we can see the three brightest stars and maybe one or two around the outer edges, but mostly this is just a big mess. It's just a smudge. Confusion has taken over and we cannot resolve these stars. However, bring Chandra along and suddenly all is clear. We're now even seeing faint stars in the wings of these bright stars in the core. So there are now 1,400 sources resolved in this star-forming region. And a number of other star-forming regions have now been observed in the same way. I'm going to add the optical picture so you can see why the X-rays are so important. They can really pinpoint these young stars from amongst all this gas and dust that's in the way. When we look in the optical or in the infrared, we often can't see them all. So here they are still in blue here and white and the, all this gas uh, around them. So Chandra really was a game changer in terms of studying star, young stars uh, in star-forming regions. So what kind of science have we done with this? We can trace previously unseen populations. For example, pro, uh, stars that have no protostellar disks, so they're not bright infrared or mid-infrared sources that you could see really well, um, but they're still shining in the X-rays. And then combining with Spitzer, for example, estimate the disk fractions of these stars. And what has been found is that between 20 and 50 percent of these sources have disks, um, and that the percentage increases as the mass decreases. When you get below about two solar masses, there are, there are more 
stars that have these disks. And can also look at the evaporation time scales, which turn out to be a few mega years, and by 10 mega years, most of them have dissipated. Can investigate the triggering of the star formation by looking at the distribution of these stars versus the age. And also, stellar X-ray activity is very key in determining whether exoplanets can form, and if they can form, can they retain their atmosphere and therefore become habitable if they happen to be in a habitable zone. And it's also good for checking the reality of candidate exoplanets by distinguishing between uh, an eclipse of, of a planet by a star and something like a star spot or a flare, which can look very similar uh, in the optical anyway. So where do x-rays come from? Why do we want to look in the x-rays at all? Well, they come from the hottest, highest energy, and most violent places in the universe, and I would argue the most exciting, but I'm not biased at all. But there are also more places that it comes from. We've talked about stars being born. Stars also accrete. They also interact, and they merge, and they die. And all these things give bright X-ray signals. Um, black holes, any kind of black hole that's accreting is a bright X-ray source, be it a stellar mass black hole, a supermassive black hole, or somewhere in between. Galaxies and clusters have very hot gas in, the, in their outskirts and even in their cores that are very bright X-ray emitters and also non-thermal emission for a variety of reasons. But we even see X-rays from planets. Well, mostly we see them for our own planets because they're the only ones near enough to see the faint signals. But we have observed several of our own planets uh, with Chandra. So basically, most types of celestial sources. And it's important to look at the X-rays along with the multi-wavelength picture of these targets so we can see what all the components are and really fully understand them. So that has been really a boon to science as a whole. So looking at solar system objects um, just to begin with, most of the X-ray emission is due to charge exchange of neutrals in the atmospheres of the planets with solar wind ions. And we have seen this kind of X-ray emission from comets, Venus, Mars, and Pluto, which was done during the New Horizons flyby particularly time, so they had some idea what the solar uh, wind flux was at that time. And it was detected with, I think, about 12 photons, which was significant, I should note. Uh, Jupiter has also been looked at a number of times, and is a bit of a different story. Uh, it has a stronger magnetic field than the other planets, and it has X-ray aurorae on both poles, the North and the South Pole. And... Um, these are believed to be triggered, or thought to be triggered, by magnetic unloading from Jupiter's equatorial plasma sheet. So somehow the charged particles are streaming along the magnetic field, and the aurora is occurring at the poles. And we've actually made, as I, as I mentioned, a number of observations while Juno's been there. And one set in particular this past summer to was, was to look, this was DDT observations actually, to look while Juno was very close to where the aurora actually is generated. Uh, so we could see the x-rays while Juno was measuring the rest of the signals that it can do from, from the aurora. So I'm now going to move on to stellar death. Birth and death are both violent things, as I'm sure we all know. Um, and look at our first light image, Cassiopeia A, which is a very famous supernova remnant. This has really become our iconic image uh, throughout the mission because the source is very rich in science and also is very pretty. We knew this would be a pretty image because we had seen it with ROSAT, but obviously not in this kind of detail. This is actually the first light image, so it's a fairly short observation. The colors give you the energy of the X-rays. Um, and in this first observation, we discovered for the first time the stellar remnant. So the remnant of the massive star that blew up which was about 340 years ago. Um, and so that central compact object had not been seen before because there's so much debris that was blown up with the star that it wasn't seen in any other wave bands. So this one actually has not been seen to vary yet. So it seems to be not a pulsar and seems to be very smooth. Actually, I was supposed to wait till I'd shown you this to say that. This is a much higher signal-to-noise uh, image of Cassé which was taken by putting, made by putting together several observations over several years uh, to make a megasecond deep image effectively. And you can see how much the uh, structure really tightens up. You see a lot more detail as you get more and more signal to noise. Um, so now going back to the central compact object. So this has not been seen to vary. So it is thought that it has a very smooth 
um, well, obviously it's not, it's not got any bright hot spots or anything, or we would have seen it vary. It's thought that the surface is very smooth and is probably liquid carbon about 10 centimeters thick on top of the 10 kilometer uh, sized um, star. So this is somewhat unusual. So continuing on, this is the same image on the left, and now I'm showing an, an optical image on the right. You can see the stars in the star field, which we're missing over here, because uh, average stars don't give us very strong x-rays. Um, what we're seeing in the optical is that there isn't anywhere near as much material that it's cool enough to emit in the optical. Most of it in a young supernova remnant emits in the x-ray. Uh, but it's also important to, um, to understand how much cool material there is there, and we can also measure very easily with this, the, um, the velocities, for example, of the different elements from uh, optical spectroscopy. So that's another uh, dimension that we find that we can also do in the x-ray, but combining the two gives us a much more complete picture. Then this, what I'm showing now on the right-hand side is the key to the colors on the left. This shows the CCD resolution spectrum of this target from high energy to low energy. And uh, so you can see where these different, there are various emission lines shown here. You can see where these different uh, lies, these different types of material uh, dominate. So, for example, this is a pretty spherical source, but there tends to be um, this disk, uh, sorry, this jet, bipolar jet in green, which tends to be mostly silicon. You can also learn by looking at the red emission here and out here. It's mostly on the outer parts of the debris. This is dominated by iron K alpha. And iron, if we remember our stellar astronomy, would have been all in the core before the star blew up. So it looks as though the star really literally blew inside out. And the, the iron from the core is now um, at the outer parts of this expanding region. So from data like this, we can understand something about the explosion itself as well. We can also measure its expansion. We've seen it expand over the last 20 years. And in fact, we can't improve this image now because if you add more data, it would be blurred by the motion of uh, the debris. And that's true of a number of supernova remnants that we've looked at. And also in a number of, of different supernova remnants, we found the central compact objects that had not been found before, and now we can study those neutron stars. Uh, in the outer parts, the blue emission here is actually synchrotron emission, and it's due synchrotron radiation, and it's due to the um, forward shock interacting with the material around it and presumably magnetic fields are involved and they're accelerating the particles and producing synchrotron emission. And this is also the site, uh, as had been suspected for many years or predicted for many years, uh, the site of cosmic ray acceleration in these outer parts. And again, this, this, um, this part, this type of emission or this component, that's the word I'm looking for, this component from a supernova remnant was not known before and it has now been seen in a number of others as well as Cassiopeia A. There are a lot of papers on, on this um, source, so I wasn't able to list them all. So I list a few of, very, uh, of, of people who've written a lot of papers on them. So if you have any questions, I know you could ask Dan or Pat, for example, who know a lot more about this than me. So here is the movie put together by our talented education and public outreach group, showing you how much this target has expanded over the last 15 years or so. You can see it expand. It then zooms into the middle, and you can see also the detailed motion of some of the filaments there. This was actually released, I think, uh, in August to celebrate first light, uh, the first light data release, which, um, image release, which was the 26th. Okay, so we've obviously been monitoring Cas A a lot over the last 20 years. Um, and one of the advantages of the long lifetime of, of Chandra is that we've been able to do this. We can do it for a number of other systems, not just supernova remnants, but I'm going to show you another supernova remnant because they're pretty dramatic. This is long-term monitoring of supernova 1987A, which has been observed at least every six months since the beginning of the mission. And this is the beginning. This is 1999. This is 2015. And the X-rays increase as the forward shock interacts with circumstellar material that the star must have let go before it blew up, before it exploded. So we can learn not only about the expanding debris, but about that circumstellar material, the extension of it, uh, how much there is, etc., cetera, um, from observing these x-rays. At about 10,000 days, which is about down here, it was seen that the x-rays started to fade, at least on one side of the image. So this is sort of the end of an era as the shock begins to move out of the outer part of this circumstellar 
uh, ring. No progenitor has yet been found in this source. It is presumed that it must be very obscured. There's still a lot of material that is visible in the center of, of uh, Tumanova 1987A. But it's possible to put some limits on the kind of neutron star it is. Um, and it's now thought that it must be highly obscured, but a thermal neutron star, so not highly magnetic um, with jets, etc., like, for example, the crab. But they'll keep looking, and presumably we'll see it eventually. Or well, somebody will. This one I, can't, uh, I just can't resist uh, showing you because it really dramatically uh, um, demonstrates why it's important to have multi-wavelength data, particularly x-rays in this case. So the, there's a source in the middle of this optical field which is the youngest pulsar in the Milky Way. That is it. doesn't look particularly exciting in the optical. Presumably the light curve would tell us that it is somewhat interesting, but it doesn't look very exciting. However, add the x-rays, and suddenly we know what we're looking at. This is a supernova remnant. The pink uh, is the soft x-ray and shows you the debris. In the middle, in the blue, is a pulsar wind nebula. Uh, so the central pulsar has a magnetic field. It's rotating, and it's, it's accelerating charged particles and producing this non-thermal emission in the pulsar wind nebula. And there are a number, as I mentioned, the crab um, also has a pulsar wind nebula in the middle. So... Go x-rays. We could really see what it looks like. Now, supernova remnants come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. So I'll just show you a few more here. Um, both Tycho and G2, is it 292? 292, thank you. Um, a pretty spherical. They're sort of similar to Cassiopeia A, though, of course, they all have their own uh, quirks as well. The Crab Nebula looks more like a spinning top. The blue and white is the Pulsar Wind Nebula. The Pulsar is down here. It has jets coming up in both directions. These jets have been seen to move. There are also standing waves here um, that do vary as material runs through them. Um, but it, it isn't actually spinning, but it looks rather like it. So we've observed this a lot too, and as I say, seen it vary. And then this one at the bottom also has a pulsar wind nebula, it's called, but it looks like a complete mess to me. <laughs> Presumably somebody understands what's going on here, but this is also a supernova remnant. So they're very photogenic. Um, so we actually have a lot of press releases on supernova remnants because they make pretty pictures. So now I'd like to move on to Chandra's primary science goal, and that was to resolve the cosmic X-ray background, which had been ubiquitous in imaging in all previous X-ray missions. There's this background of X-rays, and we didn't know exactly what it was, um, and we really wanted to understand that. So Chandra was designed to resolve the X-ray background and to understand what it's made of and how much of it might be diffuse. So uh, high spatial resolution, low background, so it can look really, really deep. This has now been resolved pretty much out to about 9 keV by the Chandra Deep Field South, which is shown on the right. Again, the colors give you the energy of the X-rays. Um, this is 7 megaseconds of time. It's the deepest field we've done. It looks back in the, the highest redshift sources. There are several above a redshift of four. It looks back at about 12 to 13 giga years to about 10% the current age of the universe. There are a 1,000 sources. Most of them are accreting supermassive black holes. The source density, 50,000 per square degree. The faintest X-ray luminosity, so at a redshift of four, a 10 to the 42, which is actually pretty faint for an accreting supermassive black hole. Also notice the range of color here. That tells you that we're actually seeing a wide range of obscuration in these sources. So we're seeing fairly highly obscured sources as well as based on you know, bright quasars where we are able to see them in all wave bands. The X-rays are better at finding these obscured sources than, for example, optical UV, where they dis the emission disappears right away. So Chandra is great at finding supermassive black holes, and it's found a lot over its 20 years. I'd like to point out one more thing. There's an optical illusion when you look at this field. It looks as though there are many more brighter sources around the edge. But in fact, that's not the case. It looks like that because the point spread function gets worse. It degrades as you move off axis. So these, the, the, pho the photons are spread throughout more pixels, so you just see them as a brighter source. However, if I zoom in to the middle, you can see there are just as many sources, but they're all now very small uh, point sources. 
So Chandra, in terms of x-ray service, has done the usual wedding cake type uh, pattern in order to sample the populations as best we can uh, with a minimum amount of, of sky being covered. So in other words, we have deep, narrow, uh, so very deep on one pencil bean surveys, that's a TDFS. There are a couple of more that, that are a few megaseconds long that are done that way. I note that the CDFS is not yet confusion limited. So potentially we could look even deeper, but it's hard to convince a TAC that you need another seven megaseconds to find you know, maybe 100 more sources on 1,000. So at the moment, we haven't looked any deeper. Um, there, are, there are medium depth, wider surveys, and there are shallow depth, very wide surveys. This is not a complete list, um, but to give you an example, there's, there's two uh, pretty wide surveys, the Cosmos, with almost two square degrees, to a depth of 160 kiloseconds. There's the extended growth strip, which is smaller in area and a little bit deeper, um, so to slightly lower flux limits. And then there are shallow, wide ones, such as the Booties field, which is six square degrees to 25 kiloseconds depth. And Stripe 82, which is the biggest single field, which isn't completely covered in the x-rays, but by combining Chandra and XMM, they've so far got 31 square degrees and 6,000 sources. So all of these, on top of having the x-rays, have very rich multi-wavelength data sets. So surveys, multi-wavelength surveys, have taken huge steps forward over the last 10 to 20 years. So some of the results that we get from this, we want to look at the evolution and also understand the population of active galaxies since in the x-rays, that's mostly what we're seeing. And I'm showing here the log n and log s, so the number of sources brighter than a given flux um, for the Chandra deep field south in the soft band, 0.5 to 2, and the hard band, 2 to 7. The red are the AGN, blue are the galaxies, and green are the stars. I'm giving the flux limits for the aficionados who'd like to know what those numbers are. It's the deepest X-ray flux limits ever, ever uh, achieved, as you already know. Look carefully at the soft band, and you'll see that the blue points are just above the red points in the last two or three bins here. So now, as we look deeper, the galaxies, the number of galaxies we're seeing is actually dominating the number of AGN. These are presumably lower redshift, much lower X-ray luminosity sources, but there are now more of them than supermassive black holes as we go to these faint flux limits. Other things we've learned, the fraction of obscured sources increases with redshift. This is seen in a number of different surveys. Uh, both um, CDFS and the other surveys at different flux <coughs> levels. Um, X-ray surveys actually do remain biased against the most obscured sources. A Compton thick source will have no signal in the Chandra band at a, at a zero redshift because all the, all the photons will have been absorbed. As you move out to higher redshift, you see more and more of that because the harder <coughs> X-rays are being moved into the observed band. Um, this has actually been very well modeled, um, for example, by add at all. And now it's possible to model your population and correct for the sources you're not seeing. And then by comparing it with the sources that we are seeing, um, confine, sorry, constrain that model, uh, refine your model. And they're now beginning to find sort of 20 to 25% Compton thick fraction. Compton thick is when you're really looking through the accretion disk and the torus. Um, that is when you're looking at a very edge on uh, active galaxy. And at this, this number agrees with low-frequency radio-selected samples, which is something actually I've been working on, on with my group, uh, where the sample is not biased in terms of obscuration because it's selected based on the lobe, the radio lobe, uh, which is optically thin. So you can see it from all angles. And that, in those very small samples, we're finding about 22% are Compton thick. So adding to all these surveys that are purpose-built surveys, we can now um, include the Chandra source catalog, which basically goes through all the data and detects all the sources, and it does spectra and, and uh, light curves, et cetera, for them all, and it's releasing them uh, into our archive. And version 2 started to be released about a year ago. People are already using it, but the final version will come out in, in October, so this month with the frozen final numbers and all the products that go along with those as well. So that will be done. What we've done in this version 2 compared with version 1 is when we've got several observations of the same field, we've combined them together so we can go much deeper and find uh, fainter sources. So this is a map of the sky covered by the CSC2, um, showing you the size of the stacks. So for some reason, we've looked at the center of the galaxy a lot. 
um, the number of stacks in that observation. So uh, you can see it's a very rich data set. Now, if we look at the standard in survey land um, sensitivity versus area for all the X-ray surveys, including XMM Newton as well, so you can see some of the ones that, that I talked about already and a, a number of other surveys made by Chandra and XMM. Um, this is how it looks. The source catalog, Chandra source catalog, is, of course, the sum of all of these, except that it hasn't yet included all of CDFS uh, to 7 megaseconds. But this yellow shows effectively what its uh, flux area uh, limit is for this Chandra source catalog. Um, also, on the right here, you, some of you may have noticed E. Rosita, which is a new X-ray satellite, which has been a long time coming, but it was launched in July, I believe. It's now on the way to L2, and it should get there, I believe, next month. And it's already turning on its instruments. We saw a little bit of sky data in Bologna a couple of weeks ago at the X-ray astronomy meeting. So it was very exciting. It's going to be doing an all-sky survey in the X-rays for the first time since ROSAT did that in the early 1990s. So this is going to be very exciting for X-ray astronomy and also for Chandra science as we follow up some of those sources. The uh, resolution will be about a factor of at least 10 worse than ours. I forget the exact resolution. But will be needed to resolve sources, I'm sure, amongst other things. I'd now like to move to active galaxies, which is the area I work on, but I'm actually not going to be talking about any of my science. Um, I'd like to talk about the first targeted source, which is one I did study with Einstein a long time ago. This is a, a quasar at a redshift of 0.66. And the idea was to have a point source that we knew would be a point source that we could focus on. And a, a quasar, the supermassive black hole is accreting. The energy that comes out is so bright that it outshines the rest of the galaxy as soon as you put it at any distance at all. So we're really seeing a point source like a star is a point source. So we looked at it, and this is what we saw. Certainly a point source that we were able to focus on, so that's the good news. But there was this linear structure on the west side that nobody was expecting. People in, I wasn't there, but apparently in the control room, people were worried and trying to figure out if something had, could have gone wrong with a satellite that would make this long, nine ox seconds, long, linear <laughs> structure on the, on the west side. They couldn't come up with anything, and eventually somebody realized, hey, this is a radio lab quasar. It's probably got a jet. And sure enough, the radio jet is right here. So we discovered X-ray emission from radio jets with our first targeted source. <coughs> this one is nine uh, arc seconds long, 100 kiloparsecs at this redshift. It has a high luminosity in the X-rays of 10 to the 44.6. I'm now showing fr from the paper writing this up, the radio data with the contours superposed and the X-ray data with radio contours superposed. And you can see that they line up very well. There are also some sort of bright spots that seem to be in common with the two. But the X-ray emission stops at the radio jet bend which we can imagine why that would happen. It's probably bending because there's some material here that it's, that it's run into and it's been deflected. And so if there are any high energy electrons giving you X-rays, they probably got slowed down and there's just no more uh, high energy electrons to give you X-rays further along the jet. So uh, the radiation mechanisms that were originally used to, to explain this X-ray emission was inverse Compton of the cosmic microwave background. As you go to higher redshift, there are more and more cosmic microwave background photons to scatter with your, from your uh, synchrotron emitting electrons to give you high energy X-rays. So that seemed to work quite well. It only needed to be mildly relativistic. However, in recent years, some of these sources, this is only one of course, but some of these sources have been looked at with Fermi, including this one, and no GeV gamma rays have been seen. And they would be predicted in this model from the B inverse Compton gamma rays as well. So now the most popular model is synchrotron emission all along the jet from a second high energy uh, electron population. Uh, so this, this observation was really the birth of multi-wavelength studies of jets, which have been very rich in terms of understanding what's happening in jets. And here's another example. This is a multi-wavelength observation of the jet in M87, the nearest um, supermassive black hole to our own galaxy. X-ray on the bottom, Hubble with various features marked, and radio, uh, BLA. I should say 0637 did not have an optical jet, but this one does, as you can see, a beautiful structure. 
So what can we learn? The spectral energy distributions of each of these knots, which are somewhat in common, but the ratios don't always look the same from knot to knot. This can tell you about, particularly with the addition of the X-rays, you can derive the magnetic field. You can look at the electron energy distribution and acceleration processes to keep that there's, uh, uh, energy, it's keep the energy up so we can keep getting X-rays. They're variable, and the superluminal superluminal motion in these sources. So from the variability, you can derive region sizes. You can look at the structure, etc. And detailed models that have come out of all this work. Um, the most popular one is called the spine sheath, at least the one I've heard the most about. Uh, model where the, the central part of the jet is highly relativistic and just keeps going. And then the, the outer part sort of protects that inner part. It's not quite so relativistic and it's interacting with the medium around it so it gets slowed down. Um, this Also, this source has recently had an exciting new result. Um, that superlum superluminal motion, which we have observed at different wavelengths, has now been observed in the Chandra data. Uh, for HST1, which is this, uh, very, this is a highly variable knot that's been moving away from the core for a while, and you can just see that it is marginally resolved from the core here, enough to see the, the motion, and then knot D. So these are at a few times C in both cases, and so hopefully we'll get more information about superluminal motion uh, as Chandra keeps observing these sources. I also can't resist reminding you all, and I'm sure you all know this, but this is also the source that the EHT looked at, the core. So five orders of magnitude, better resolution than Chandra. This is what we saw, of course. Very exciting. The first image of an, a horizon of a supermassive black hole. So now, uh, moving on to binary supermassive black holes. This is a nearby CFIT2 galaxy, a redshift point 0.02, called NGC 6240, which is actually a merging pair of galaxies. And the red is the optical picture. You can see it's a mess. It seems to have spiral arms going everywhere. It was known in the optical to have two bright sources in the core, but they didn't know exactly what they were. And only with Chandra were those two resolved in the X-rays, and it was clear that they're both accreting supermassive black holes. So this is a binary supermassive black hole. Uh, they're only a kiloparsecond apart, so they're pretty close together and they will eventually merge. And when they do merge, um, depending, well, not when these particular ones merge, but when others like it merge, ESA's LISA satellite, which is their gravitational wave mission, <coughs> should be able to detect merging supermassive black holes. LIGO and Virgo detect merging stellar mass black holes, but you need a much bigger baseline to get the supermassive black hole ones. This is supposed to launch in the early 2030s. Uh, slated for launch, I should say. So um, there are now more. There's sort of tens of known binary supermassive black holes in the cores of usually merging systems. They're found in a variety of ways. They're often confirmed with Chandra being able to see the two um, active nuclei. It's found that they're in about 10% of galaxies, and the X-ray brightest are the ones in, in closer pairs. <coughs> if you were to study the number versus separation, you'd learn a lot about galaxy mergers and supermassive black hole mergers. It's been hard to have a sort of uniformly detected sample, and Julie Coverford has done some work on this, but there's still, I think, more to be done. Um, there are, oh, this movie, again from our Education and Public Outreach group, visualizes what happened to NGC 6240. So these two galaxies get too close, they can't get apart, and now we've zoomed into the middle, and we have these two accretion disks with little black dots in the middle like the one in the middle of M87, and they're moving around each other, and this is probably about where 6240 is now, and as time goes by, they will slow down, get closer and closer together. Theory has trouble predicting, actually, how they finally merge, but we're sure they will. And when they do, you'll see, hey, presto, gravitational waves. There are a couple more. Uh, there are just as examples, um, this is, these two are 20 kiloparsecs apart. Again, the Chandra data is in blue, <coughs> and the ground-based optical data shows the, the arms are doing all kinds of weird things. It's a merging system. And here's another one, which are only four kiloparsecs apart, uh, with the red as the optical data. <coughs> Excuse me. Most recently, in fact, I think the press release was only a couple of days ago from Chandra, we found a rare we presume they're rare, triple system. Um, this is in an SDSS galaxy. I'm not going to read out the name. It's at a redshift 0.077. And there are three 
X-ray uh, sources. In the middle of this, this is the optical picture. There's clearly a very complex system of three merging galaxies. They've seen emission lines in all three. In two of them, they see broad passion alpha. They've ruled out all other possible possibilities, such as star formation <coughs> regions and, and shock-based emission, or having less than three AGN. So this looks quite a convincing case of a triple system, which is very exciting. It was found from looking for mergers in uh, WISE data. So they have more, more sources they found, but this is the only triple so far. Now, the triple systems could solve the problem of the, the, the final in spiral of the merging systems, and apparently these will occur more quickly in a triple system. So this is exciting stuff, and hopefully we'll find more. I'd now like to move on to clusters of galaxies, which are the largest gravitationally bound uh, sources in the universe. And this movie shows the central, the optical picture of the central part of the Perseus cluster, which is one of our nearby neighbors. This is NGC 1275 in the core with its beautiful filaments that are star-forming filaments stretching out almost radially. And now we're going to merge from the optical into the X-rays. And this is the Chandra picture of the middle of the Perseus cluster. And it lit, the X-ray gas, hot gas, literally fills all the space between the galaxies. There's 10 times more mass around 10 times more mass in this hot gas than there is in the galaxies. And there's all this structure. We knew there was hot gas in clusters. We'd seen it with Einstein and Rosat, but we hadn't seen any structure before. We didn't have the resolution, and we expected them to be pretty boring. We'd just be measuring masses and temperature profiles. But no, they're very dynamic, which is very exciting. So we have these sort of waves. These are cold fronts. There's it's like swirling of the gas, probably because another cluster came by and just disturbed it all, and it's, it's all swirling. And then we have sharp shock fronts and voids near the center here. This is where NGC 1275 is. And there's an active galaxy here, and it's sending out radio jets. And they're creating these voids and all the shocks around them in the middle of this cluster. And um, basically, this is a fossil record of all the activity, the radio jet-based activity from this AGM. <coughs> and we've seen this kind of structure wherever we go. So very interesting, again, a sort of new field that wasn't really expected. Here's another example where you can see the whole cluster. Um, this is at a higher redshift, point 0.2. Now the blue is the X-ray gas, and the red is the radio plasma, and the white is the galaxies and, and the stars that happen to be in the way. Um, so as I mentioned, the blue dominates in terms of the number of baryons, the normal matter. It's also the site of star formation as the gas cools. And also that gas, as it cools, falls down into the middle and accretes onto the active nucleus and probably uh, triggers more AGN activity. So then we have radio jets that come out. They push the hot gas aside. You can look, if you look here, you can see there's really very little X-ray gas right around this radio plasma. It's been pushed out of the way and heated up in doing so. And it keeps doing that for probably... Uh, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 years, heating up that material, and then things gradually cool, and then the stars begin to form, and the mass begins to fall into the middle, etc. And so you end up with a feedback loop, which moderates both the stellar and the supermassive black hole growth. This one also is a, one of the largest continuous radio jets, with 350 megaparsecs in length, I think, for half the arm. Um, so, very dynamic places, clusters of galaxies. They've also enabled us to um, investigate dark matter, which is, of course, the biggest single component of the gravitational force in, the, in clusters that keep the material together. What I'm showing you here is two colliding clusters, which are known jointly as the bullet cluster. They also have a, a telephone name, which, which is a 1E name. But it's known as the bullet cluster because of this structure here. In this picture, the pink is the hot X-ray emitting gas. The white, of course, is the optical emission, the galaxies and the clusters. You can see them here and here. And then the blue is the inferred dark matter that has been inferred from lensing uh, of these galaxy images from actually ground-based ESO Wi-Fi um, data. And, but there's also HST data in this image as well. So if we look at this picture, we see that the dark matter aligns with the galaxies uh, and the hot gas is in between the two. So they're clearly separated. The dark matter is clearly separated from the baryons, the majority of the baryons, the X-ray gas. So what's happening? Here's another uh, EPO movie. 
So now we're just looking at the dark matter and the hot gas, and these two clusters are moving through one another. And so this is what we think happened, that the dark matter basically keeps going. Um, the, the galaxies keep going. They go through each other, and there's a lot of space. They're pretty dense. They don't really see one another. They just keep going. The X-ray gas, the particles inter interact with one another, and it slows down. So a bit like blowing a smoke ring uh, into the air versus firing a bullet, which is much more dense. Now, the dark matter has gone with the galaxies, so obviously it does not self-interact. So um, we have a drag on the gas. We have no drag on either the stars or the dark matter. And this, combined with observations from a, num another, a number of other um, merging clusters, has provided a, an <coughs> upper limit on the self-interaction cross-section per unit mass of 1.25 centimeters squared per gram, which has been able to uh, remove a few candidates from dark matter particles. And this keeps on going as more of these observers, uh, more of these clusters get observed. Uh, we'll just get more information on this. Okay, and then finally, there are gratings on Chandra, and they have beautiful high resolution. And there are beautiful pictures, uh, grating spectra of stars, <coughs> of supernova remnants, of many different kinds of sources. But I'm going to show you an active galaxy, partly because I work on active galaxies, and partly because this is my favorite. Um, this is the first long observation of an active galaxy, taken with a high-energy transmission grating on Chandra. This is a, a type 2, sorry, a type 1, <coughs> so broadline galaxy, at a redshift 0.01. The black is the data, the red is the model. So all these wiggles, which you might, to begin with, if you just look at the data, thought, might think were noise, they're all, in fact, signal. So it's incredibly rich spectrum in the x-rays, uh, with all these different elements being represented as indicated here. And so for the first time, I was seeing an x-ray spectrum that looked comparable to the optical spectra I used to take as a graduate student on big telescopes in Australia of high range of quasars. So to me, this is very exciting. I don't work on these spectra, but I just love them. So the model here, to model these absorption features, in this particular paper, there were several different papers that, that have looked at this, was of a two-phase clumpy absorber, high and low ionization, the two phases, in pressure equilibrium. There's an outflow of 750 kilometers per second of this material which agrees with the um, speed seen in the UV absorber, so presumably oxygen-6 type, you know, high-energy UV lines, high-ionization UV lines. You can derive a mass outflow rate. We're mostly looking at absorption, so we don't really know very well what the outflow rate is, but about 0.2 to 4 m sum per year, which is high enough to impact the galaxy. And I also wanted to show you this beautiful piece in the profile, which happened to be off the edge of the spectrum of an oxygen-8 line where you see the emission and the absorption from the same material. So beautiful X-ray spectra. So um, Chandra's gone for 20 years. What's next? So we now have a contract extension from NASA, which started a year ago, which takes us potentially through 2027 to, in terms of operation with three years of closeout. This doesn't guarantee you will observe, we'll keep operating until 2027. It also doesn't tell us we have to stop then, but it's the legal and, and more important perhaps funding profile uh, that allows us to do that, and it also demonstrates that we have great support from NASA. We have no expendables, <laughs> apart from fuel, of which there's plenty. We have a stable orbit, and we had a very detailed engineering review about five years ago that showed no showstoppers to 25 years and more of, of uh, operations. There's, there's nothing that's going to run out in 25 years that we will then have to stop. So we expect to keep going. We hope to be going, keep going at least 10 more years. Our current status is that the observing efficiency remains at about 70%, which is the maximum possible, 70% um, of wall clock time, because we're in the belts for the rest of the time. Our oversubscription, so the de demand for Chandra time, is remaining high at, at about the same every year, 5.5, in observing time. We have a high impact with more than 8,000 science papers to date, about 480 per year. They're highly cited, an average of 35 after six years. We have more than 4,000 PIs and COIs in 43 countries to date. This doesn't count archive users that we don't require to register. And we actually know that archive data has been downloaded into, I think, about 160 countries. 
um, in the last few years. Cycle 22 is coming along. The call for proposals will be out in December. The deadline will be in March. This is our usual schedule, so please get ready. We do have a couple of major problems which we're managing, and many of you will be familiar with. The thermal insulation on the satellite is degrading, so everything is getting warm. What this means is that mission and, and, and operations planning team have to work incredibly hard to keep our efficiency as high as 70%. We can't sit at the same solar pitch angle for very long, usually only tens of kiloseconds, before something will overheat. Um, so we have to split observations up, and we have to monitor the subsistent temperatures very carefully, and we actually model them as a function of pitch angle for every weekly schedule that's built, and every one that's rebuilt because of a TOO, et cetera. So we're managing it, but uh, things continue to get warmer. We also have a buildup of contaminant on the ACES window. The contaminant is now significantly thicker than the window itself. It has significantly reduced the effective area below about 1.5 kV. So in, in fact, soft X-ray science is quite difficult now. We can no longer look at planetary nebulae efficiently, for example. And the outskirts of galaxies where there's a lot of hot gas, you can only look at the most nearby ones. But there's plenty more science to do. We still have a you know, pristine 2 to 10 kV energy range, for example. Um, so those are the things that we're managing. So the future for Chandra science is bright. We can expand on our current science. We've only looked at a few percent of the sky so far. There are many more sources out there. We can complete and, and or increase samples. We can look at more clusters for cosmology, more star-forming regions, etc., etc. We can look at individual sources in more detail. And recent examples of Cygnus A, uh, which had a beautiful long observation a couple of years ago, A both 2146. The Orion Nebula has observations coming up. They may have already started, because I think it was last year approved with the gratings, where the team reckon they can separate the spectra from the individual <coughs> sources in a single observation. So that's really going to be exciting. Um, track even further the evolution of supernova remnants and other things that we track, like stars that are moving around each other, for example. We can search for the WIM along more lines of sight. I'm going to come to that in a minute. This is kind of an ongoing science story. The Chandra source catalog will continue to expand so that more and more people who don't know how to you know, X-ray astronomy very well will just be able to take the products from the catalog and add them to their multi-wavelength data sets. And we will continue to have releases of new data every couple of years or so as the archive uh, expands. At the moment, we're going to the end of 2014. That's all the data that's included. We can resolve and track transient phenomena. A lot of X-ray targets are transient. I actually haven't talked much about those today because it's not an area that I know very well, though, of course, I'm involved with it with making decisions on directory time, for example. This will just get more with, with LIGO and Virgo, Erosita coming along, and then the LSST era, era of transients. And then, of course, as new facilities come online, we have new science to do in collaboration with them. So TESS is now up and working. We, we're already doing some studies in coordination with TESS on stars and other things TESS observes, uh, and also exoplanet candidates. Erosita I mentioned earlier, we're certainly going to need to follow up clusters, for example, and AGN. We already have a GTO program in the current cycle, cycle 21, which starts at around Christmas, to follow up some Erosita clusters. JWST is coming along, and infrared X-ray studies are very um, important to many areas of science, AGN, of course, stars, galaxies. And then two more X-ray missions, CRISM, which is a replacement for Hitomi, will have a very high <coughs> spectral resolution calorimeter with not very great spatial resolution, but we'll get these beautiful spectra. And from Hitomi, before it, it, it died, we already have some very rich spectra that have done a lot of science. So we're looking forward to this replacement mission, and I'm sure Chandra will be doing imaging along with it. And then the first imaging X-ray polarimeter, an explorer mission led by Martin Weisskopf, who's our project scientist as well, he's got two hats at the moment, um, will no doubt be following up on highly polarized targets that they're observing with that. I'd just like to finish with a couple of sort of new science type things as examples. Um, this, from a couple of years ago, so it's, it's old news, but it's the beginning of a new field, was the first merging neutron stars that were detected by LIGO and Virgo three days before this total solar eclipse as we were all flying out 
to uh, Sun Valley, Idaho to see the eclipse and go to the head meeting. Um, this, this got triggered. It was seen in gravitational waves and two seconds later as a faint short gamma ray burst with both Fermi and Integral. And so this was the first neutron star, merging neutron star candidate they detected and was the, the best chance to see electromagnetic um, emission from uh, a gravitational wave source. So as soon as it got dark, all the telescopes in South America that were able to, the optical telescopes, uh, turned their eyes to the sky to cover the fairly large uh, error range in terms of the position of this source. And within a few hours, it found it, um, a bright source in the outskirts of this elliptical galaxy. This is the Hubble image, but I'd like to stress that this was found with ground-based telescopes. That's what you need for this kind of thing to cover a lot of, of sky quickly. It was tracked, it faded and reddened over two weeks. You, you've heard this story from expert speakers already in this room in the last two years. It was a, there was a kilonova going on. Our process elements were formed. All very exciting for many, many reasons. But the X-ray story is also exciting. Um, when we looked at it two days later, this was with previously peer review approved TOOs, I should know. They were already ready to go for this kind of um, event. Uh, we looked at it and didn't see it two days later. So it's a soft gamma ray burst. So you, it, would, it was very faint. Usually we see the ones that, where there's a jet pointing right at us. Clearly it wasn't pointing right at us. So it's faint in the gamma rays and non-existent in x-rays until a week later when we started to see it. So as the jet moves away, it expands, and it moved into our line of sight, and we saw it. So the x-rays already told us that it's a jet being viewed off axis. The source went behind the sun two weeks later, and no x-ray or any other observations except radio were possible until December. It was detected in the radio. It was increasing in the radio. As soon as it came out from behind the sun, we looked at it, and we found that it was about four to five times brighter than it had been in, uh, at the beginning of September, moving in lockstep with the radio, so clearly synchrotron emission. So this is a um, uh, schematic of, of the data. Well, this is the real data. This is the light curve. We didn't see it. We did see it. Um, it continued to increase till I think it's about 160 days after the original trigger and then turned over um, and then decayed as expected for uh, a short gamma ray burst. So what happened was, to begin with, we didn't see it at all because here was the core of the jet and here we were looking. As it expanded out, we started to see the outer edge, which wasn't very relativistic or very bright, but we could see it. And then it got brighter until we were looking down the core that had expanded further. Okay, and so then it started to decay just because it's expanded. So um, the Chandra monitoring continues, and it was still just about detected in 100 kiloseconds about three or four weeks ago, the last time we looked. I think it's no longer visible in the radio. And we're waiting for the next one, uh, or perhaps a neutron star black hole merger. We did, actually, we looked at one in DDT time a couple of weeks ago, uh, the last surviving candidate was in the middle of a galaxy, and we thought it was probably an AGN. It was a radio source that had been seen to vary. There was a report of emission lines, which I think must have been wrong. So we thought we'd look at it because we'd be able to say, yes, it's an AGN. It can't be the, the gravitational wave source. But in fact, it wasn't seen by Chandra, and the upper limit is about 10 to the 40. So it's way below any AGN. So it doesn't tell us it was this source, the, the gravitational wave source, but it tells us it wasn't a, an AGN. So that was useful information, I suppose. But we're waiting for the next one. We have programs in place. Final, one final thing. New techniques come along. And I'm sure many of you are aware that at low redshift, we have a missing baryon problem. Compared with the baryons measured at high redshift, at low redshift, we're missing about a third. It is thought to be in a warm, hot intergalactic medium with temperatures below and above 10 to the 5 K. And uh, there have been observations with using a, an outbursting AGN as a background over the years with both China and XMM, three sigma detections. Somebody else comes along and says, no, it isn't real. There's a lot of arguments about it. It's really pushing the limit of what either Chandra or XMM can do. But this is quite a hopeful um, most recent uh, detection that's been seen, which updated an earlier technique. And what they're doing is they're looking at a source that is known to have UV absorption line. So we're looking from Chandra through a bunch of filaments. There's only six here, but this particular one has 17 UV absorption systems along the line of sight to this quasar at a redshift of almost three. And what they did was take a 470 kilosecond observation with a grating, 
and then stack it on the redshift of each one of those systems, the absorbing systems, and found a detection at 3 sigma, 3.3 sigma, which looks very convincing in this particular figure. So very exciting. They were then given, I think, a two megasecond observation. Or maybe it's only one. Anyway, a long observation um, in the next cycle to turn this into a five sigma detection or not, as the case may be. Um, the, the numbers they get, the equivalent with the four milliangstroms, the column density are consistent with what one might expect from the WIMP. So it's really quite exciting. Our planning group's not very happy because this is actually at a high ecliptic latitude. And it's very hard to observe because <laughs> uh, things get very hot. <coughs> but from a science point of view, it's very exciting. So I'm just going to close with some pretty pictures, and it's already 5 o'clock just after, so I'll stop there. You've seen some of these during my talk and others you haven't. There are plenty more where this came from. Thank you. <laughs> could, I yeah, could I mention one more thing before I forget? We put some 20 year swag outside on the shelf. So if anyone wants stickers or pins or pens, help yourself. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, great. So do we have any uh, questions for Belinda? Charles? Oh, yes, but, but that's an illusion. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because the size of the dots are, are to indicate how many stacks we have and how many sources we have. It's not really the area of the sky. Oh, I didn't mean the area. I mean, you, 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 it seems oh. like you, you've covered a significant, you've sampled a significant. Oh, yes, yeah, that's true. That's not an illusion. Yeah. Um, where is it? It's not very far before this. Uh, before all the AGM. Anyway, um, yeah, we have covered a lot in terms of the range of the sky, but not in terms of the fraction of area in the sky. No, prob that's probably, I guess that was real. Um, probably because there are more astronomers in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, well, it depends what you're looking at, right? <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, we, in the x-rays and with Chandra, we don't discriminate. It's just a case of, of what people want to look at. So, yeah, I think you're right. There are more in the north than the south. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you expect to have any sort of formal preparation with your Zeta people to follow some follow-up on the most interesting sources? Um, Yes, that usually comes through either the GTOs, which is the, the one we currently have. Uh, one of our GTOs has agreed to work with them and put some time into looking at clusters, I believe. I think that's right. Uh, or it could come through proposals with a peer review. It's usually done that way because it would need a fair amount of time. Uh, though, actually, I'm not sure I should mention this in company. <laughs> Paul Nandro was asking me if we could look at the North Ecliptic Pole. <laughs> <laughs> which is where one of their surveys will be. And I said, well, depends how much time they want because it's difficult to do. But usually it would come through the um, you know, general call for proposals and teams will get together and put in a proposal. And I imagine they'd be well received as long as they're feasible. Yeah, because there's carbon and fluorine and oxygen in it, so that's where, where the absorption is. Um, we don't really know exactly what it is. We know certain elements that are in there. There's probably been different components off the satellite that have outgassed over the time and landed, you know, built up on the window in different, different layers. We keep hoping it'll slow down. Everyone who knows about space missions tells us it will eventually level off, but it hasn't yet. Uh, we keep getting a little hopeful as the point is low, and then the next year it's high again. So it's increasing linearly. And as I say, it's, it's thicker than the filter itself now. So. The spectrum is cold, so it condenses on the window. Yeah. Um, since the XMM Newton is somewhat uh, up here, observatory, I'm curious if you can remind us uh, what the status of that telescope is. Mm -hmm. 
compare and contrast their, their uh, strengths and highlights areas where we yeah, really work yeah. together? Yeah, we work together quite often with XMM, in fact. Um, it's still going very well as well, and they're celebrating 20 years. Uh, they were launched in December of 1999, so they're actually going to celebrate mostly next year, since we took, we took the whole of this year, so they took <laughs> next year. Um, they have a bigger mirror, so they collect more counts than we do. They're more efficient at looking at, at, at um, you know, getting a spectrum of a source, for example. But their resolution is about a factor of 10 worse. Um, so they can't resolve the really fine structure that we see or the very crowded fields. So in, in many ways, we're complementary. If you know you have an isolated source and you want a really good spectrum as quickly as possible, unless you were looking for a high-resolution grating, which I think we just about beat them in terms of the high-resolution grating. They do have grating, but depends on what part of the spectrum you want. Um, but uh, So if you have an isolated source, um, you might go to XMM to get a more efficient high-signal-to-noise uh, information from it, for example. And then if you're looking at a cluster that can be very big, and with Chandra, you might need to do multiple observations, and it would take a long time. You can get maybe a picture of the whole cluster, uh, an image of the whole cluster with XMM, and then you can see areas, perhaps in XMM, that look as though they might have structure or be more dense or have a filament, and go in with Chandra and, and look at those. These are just examples I'm sort of pulling out of a hat, but we're quite complementary in many of the things we do. And also, sometimes we reinforce one another's results, if they're, uh, an, or, or not, as the case may be, if it's something like the WIM <laughs> detection. It's usually not, but, uh, and vice versa. But it's, uh, it's really useful to have a second X-ray mission that can um, be reinforcing you. If you're working in an optical on the ground, for example, that happens all the time. You know, somebody sees something, another telescope looks, they see it again, or they don't see it, and, you know, you get reinforcement. So that's been very important. So they're still going with us. So they're our collaborators in many ways. And their proposal deadline is next Friday? Very yeah. soon, yeah. <laughs> We also have joint time with them. So if somebody wants to do something like I was just describing, you can also do that with star-forming regions, for example, or surveys. Um, they can write a proposal to one or the other and get both sets of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, since the dark matter has gravitational force with the ordinary matter, and they may have gravitational force with itself too, right? Mm -hmm. Why is half by itself without, why is a two glass half by without? Mm -hmm. Because the individual particles don't see each other. They don't interact with one another. But they have gravity. Yeah, that's true. The motion must be fast enough. I mean, the, the galaxies also have kept going. They probably slowed down. The point is that they didn't slow down as much as the gas. The gas slowed down more, perhaps, not just due to gravity, but because of self-interaction, whereas the dark matter <laughs> and the, the galaxies just slowed down due to gravity, but not interaction. So it, it puts a limit on the interaction of the dark matter particles with one another, and also with the gas particles, actually. Uh, can you can you think of a, a one or two ways that being director of such a large mission has been different than you expected? Oh gosh, <laughs> I enjoyed it more than I expected. Perhaps that's true. No, not really. I mean, it, I didn't know what to expect uh, when I became director. I just knew I didn't want to train somebody else to be director, <laughs> so, so I had to be it myself. Because um, <laughs> I've been deputy sort of so assistant director for a while, so I knew sort of part of what the job was. Um, I think the, the most surprising thing that I'm continually surprised by is that the amazing team we have at the CXC. And when I look at some of the dysfunction around the country and in different places in the news, and of course you only see the bad bits in the news, I'm continuously grateful that we have such a wonderful team. They're all incredibly talented people, very, very dedicated to Chandra. They go beyond, above and beyond, over and over again. As you know, we have anomalies, we move the OCC, we have lots of outreach, and people are giving colloquia all over the, the country, you know, all this extra stuff we're doing, and people just keep stepping up. So I think that's the, the most fun part of being the director, and probably is something I hadn't really thought about before. You know, that how important it is to have a good and dedicated team. Um, so 
what, what's your vision looking forward uh, as uh, Chandra kind of mer uh, you know goes into links, right? So you didn't mention links, but uh, <laughs> but uh, um, you know what what's what's the future of X-ray astronomy in in the context of Chandra? Yeah, well, it would be nice if Chandra could carry on going until Lynx flies. Um, that would be great, because otherwise there's going to be a big gap. But you know, Lynx will be a bigger and better Chandra uh, if it ever flies, and it'll look to the, you know, the first black holes. And at the moment, we're only looking to redshift about four in the X-rays, and we want to see how these things formed. You know, how, how did those first supermassive black holes come about? And we'll be able to see them with Lynx. And we'll also be able to see how galaxies form, because... You know, we can't really observe the soft X-ray gas in the outskirts of galaxies with Chandra anymore, except in the most nearby systems, because it's quite faint. It's very diffuse. So with, with Lynx, we'll be able to do that. So we'll be able to tie in. I mean, that is actually a lot of mass in the X-ray gas. It's very important to how galaxies form. Um, and then just look deeper into all populations. And some of them are only scratching the surface. So there's a lot more X-ray science out there to be done after Chandra and hopefully something bigger and better. Oh gosh. <laughs> I, know, I gave you a lot of surprises today. The one I was, I'm most interested in, because I work on AGM, was the Park 0637 and seeing the jets. And I do work on the 3CR sample, which is a radio sample, although I don't actually work on the jets very much. We work on the lobes, see the x-rays from the lobes and determine the binary, the uh, black hole. Uh, magnetic field, sorry, it begins with B. <laughs> magnetic field and maps and that sort of thing. Um, so that was very surprising. But um, I know, we're continually surprised. It's really exciting. Anyone else? Okay, if there's no other questions, then let's thank you for the again. Isn't it protecting Pluto after all? Well, that was a good one, yeah. <laughs> Surprise to me. <laughs> Well, they, they convinced me they were going to, otherwise I wouldn't have given them all yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. It's yeah. true. And I know I said, no, there's no way. This is probably very naive because I'm a layman, but...